In the deepest depths of Stirling University lies a man. A man who ponders important questions. Not questions like, what's the meaning of life? Or, why are we here? But questions that center over one concept. How do I scare my audience? Tonight, he will answer that question, reading tales that are so utterly horrifying they may leave you weak at the knees. Welcome to the Spook Zone. Ladies, gentlemen, other eldritch abominations, I welcome you to this little show called The Spook Zone, where I read you things that are scary and you probably get scared and that's good because who doesn't like a little scare once in a while um i can't think of one at the moment so that's wait a minute uh yeah no actually i can think of a lot of people who don't get enjoy who don't enjoy getting scared um well that plan fell flat in its face what are we doing tonight then so we're reading from the necronomicon the commemorative edition of it in fact the best weird tales of H.P. Lovecraft. It's a big book. It's very heavy. If I let it fall on the floor like so, it'll make a loud noise. That wasn't that too loud this time because I decided to do it away from the microphone because I don't like clipping that much. You know, as much as I as much as I enjoy dropping this book. But in terms of what we're actually reading, we are reading a little tale called The Music of Eric Zahn, which I'm not sure how long it will be. Might be the case that I take all the all the time with it, like all the entire hour with this. Hopefully not, though, because um, I do want to read something from the internet. Because by God, the internet is just a bastion of terror sometimes. And uh, yeah, it's it's fun to read the uh, more contemporary stuff as opposed to this uh, Lovecraftian uh, hullabaloo. Anyway. Without further ado, I'm going to get started on the music of Eric Zahn, and I'm not sure really sure what to expect, apart from the general Lovecraft fair. Hopefully he isn't either racist or takes too long describing, like, repeats himself over and over again, which he has a uh, tendency to do. Hopefully this will just be, uh, just be a, a straight shot, a straight good, good little thing. This is the music of Eric Zahn. I have examined maps of the city with the greatest care, yet have never found again the Rue d'Orcile. These maps have not been modern maps alone, for I know that their names change. Uh, I have, on the contrary, delved deeply into all the antiques of the place and and have personally explored every region of whatever name which could possibly answer to the street I knew as the Rue d'Orcile. But despite all I have done, it remains a humiliating fact that I cannot find the house, the street, or even the locality where during the last months of my impoverished life as a student of metaphysics at the university, I heard the music of Eric Zahn. That my memory is broken, I do not wonder, for my health, physical and mental, was gravely disturbed throughout my period of residence in the Rue d'Orcile, and I recall that I took none of my few acquaintances there. But that I cannot find the place again is both singular and perplexing. For it was within a half hour's walk of the university and was distinguished by peculiarities which could hardly be forgotten by anyone who had been there. I have never met a person who has seen the Rue d'Orcile. The Rue d'Orcile lay across a dark river, bordered by precipitous brick brick blair windowed warehouses and spanned by a ponderous bridge of dark stone. It was always shadowy along that river, as if the smoke of the neighboring factory shut out the sun perpetually. The river was also odorous with evil stenches, which I have never smelled elsewhere, and which may someday help me to find it, since I should recognize them at once. Beyond the bridge were narrow, cobbled streets with rails, and then came the ascent. At first gradual, but incredibly steep, as the Rue d'Orcil was reached. I've never seen another street as narrow and as steep as the Rue d'Orcil. It was almost a cliff, closed all vehicles, consisting in several places of flights of steps, and ending at the top of a lofty, ivied wall. 
Its paving was irregular, sometimes stone slabs, sometimes cobblestones, and sometimes bare earth with struggling greenish-grey vegetation. The houses were tall, peak-roofed, and incredibly old, and crazily leaning backward, forward, and sideways. Occasionally, an opposite pair, both leaning forward, almost met across the street like an arch. And certainly, they kept most of the light from the ground below. There were a few overhead bridges from house to house across the street. The inhabitants of that street impressed me peculiarly. At first, I thought it was because they were all silent and reticent, but later decided it was because they were all very old. I do not know how I came to live on such a street, but I was not myself when I moved there. I had been living in many poor places, always evicted for want of money, until at last I came upon that tottering house in Rue Seal, kept by the paralytic Blando. It was the third house from the top of the street, and by far the tallest of them all. My room was on the fifth story, the only inhabited room there, since the house was almost empty. On the night I arrived, I heard strange music from the peaked garret overhead, and the next day asked old Blandard about it. He told me it was an old German, an old German viol player, a strange, dumb man who signed his name as Eric Zahn, and who played evenings in a cheap theatre orchestra adding that Zan's desire to play in the night after his return from the theatre was the reason he had chosen this lofty and isolated garret room whose single gabble, win gabble window was the only point of the street which one could look over the terminating wall at the declivity and the paranorma beyond. Thereafter, I heard Zan every night, and although he kept me awake, I was haunted by the weirdness of his music. Knowing little of the art myself, I was yet certain that none of his harmonies had any relation to music I had heard before, and concluded that he was the composer of highly original genius. The longer I listened, the more I was fascinated, until after a week I resolved to make the old man's acquaintance. One night, as he was returning from his work, I intercepted Zan in the hallway and told him that I would like to know him and be with him when he played. He was a small, lean, bent person with shabby clothes, blue eyes, grotesque, satyr-like face, a nearly bald head, and at first my words seemed both angered and frightened. My obvious friendliness, however, finally melted him, and he grudgingly motioned me to follow him up the dark, creaking, and rickety attic stairs. His room, one of two in the steeply pitched garret, was on the west side, toward the high wall that formed the upper end of the street. Its size was very great, and seemed the greater because of its extraordinary barrenness and neglect. Of furniture there was only a narrow iron bedstead, a dingy washstand, a small table, a large bookcase, an iron music rack, and three old-fashioned chairs. Sheets of music were piled in disorder about the floor. The walls were bare boards and had probably never known plaster, whilst the abundance of dust and cobwebs made the place seem even more deserted than inhabited. Evidently, Eric Zahn's world of beauty lay in some far cosmos of the imagination. Motioning me to sit down, the dumb man closed the door, turned the large wooden bolt, and lighted a candle to the augment, the one he had brought with him. He now removed his vial from his moth-eaten covering and, taking it, seated himself in the least uncomfortable of the chairs. He did not employ the music rack, but offering no choice and playing from memory, enchanted me for over an hour with strains I had never heard before, strains which must have been of his own devising. Uh, to describe their exact nature is impossible for one unversed in music. They were a kind of fugue with recurrent passages of the most captivating quality, but to me, were notable for the absence of any of the weird notes I have heard, overheard from my room below on other occasions. Those haunting notes I had remembered, and had often hummed and whistled inaccurately to myself. So when the player at length laid down his bow, I asked him if he would 
render some of them. As I began my request, the wrinkled satyr-like face lost the bored placidity it had possessed in the, during the playing, and seemed to show the same curious mixture of anger and fright which I had noticed when I first accosted the old man. For a moment I was inclined to use persuasion regarding rather lightly the whims of senility, and even tried to awaken my host's weirder mood by whistling through the strains to which I had listened to night before. But I did not pursue this course for more than a moment, for when the dumb musician recognized the whistled air, well, the whistled air this face grew suddenly assorted, with an expression wholly beyond analysis and his long, cold, bony right hand reached out to stop my mouth and silenced that cruel, that crude imitation. As he did this, he further demonstrated his eccentricity by casting a startled glance toward the lone curtained window. As if fearful of some intruder, a glance doubly absurd, since the garret stood high and inaccessible above all the adjacent roofs. This window being the only point in the steep street, as the concierge had told me, from which one could see over the wall at the summit. The old man's glance brought Blandit's remark to my mind, and with a certain capriciousness I felt a wish to look over the wide and dizzying panorama of moonlit roofs and city lights beyond the hilltop, which of all the dwellers of the Rudy Seal only in this which, out of all the dwellers of the Rudy Seal, only this crabbed musician could see. I moved towards the to window and would have drawn aside the nondescript curtains when a frightened rage, even greater than before, the dumb lodger was upon me again. This time, motioning with his head toward the door as he nervously strode to drag me thither with both hands. Now thoroughly disgusted with my host, I offered him to release me, and I told him I would go at once. His clutch relaxed, and as he saw my disgust and offence, his own anger seemed to subside. He tightened his relaxing grip, but this time in a friendly manner, forcing me into a, a chair. Then, with an appearance of wistfulness, crossing to the little table where he wrote many words with a pencil in the laboured French of a foreigner. The note which he finally handed me was an appeal for tolerance and forgiveness. Zan said that he was old, lonely, and afflicted with strange fears and nervous disordered con disorders connected with his music and other things. He had enjoyed my listening to his music and had wished I'd come again and not mind his eccentricities, but he could not play to another his weird harmonies. I could not bear hearing them from another, nor could he bear having anything in his room touched by another. He had not known until our half-hallway conversation that I could overhear his playing in his room, and now asked me if I would arrange with Blandot the, to take a lower room where I could not hear him in the night. He would, he wrote, defray the difference in rent. As I sat deciphering the excretable, excretable, ex uh, execrable, there we go, French, I felt more lenient toward the old man. He was a victim of physical and nervous suffering, as was I, and my metaphysical studies had taught me kindness. In the silence there came a slight sound from the window. The shutter must have rattled in the night wind, and for some reason I started almost violent, as violently as Eric Zan. So when I finished reading, I shook my host by the hand and departed as a friend. The next day, Blanot gave me a more expensive route on the third floor, between the apartments of an aged moneylender and the room of a respectable upholster. There was no one on the fourth floor. It wasn't long before I found that Zan's eagerness for my company was not as great as it seemed while persuading me to move down from the fifth story. He did not ask me to call on him, and when I did call, he appeared uneasily and played listlessly. This was always at night. In the day, he slept and would admit to no one. My liking for him didn't grow, though the attic room and the weird music seemed to hold an old fascination for me. I had a curious desire to look out of that window, over the wall and down the unseen slope at the glittering roofs and spires which must lay out, lie outspread there, 
Once I went up with Garrett. <coughs> Once I went up to the Garrett during these theater hours when Zan was away, but the door was locked. What I did succeed doing was to overhear the nocturnal playing of the dumb old man. At first, I, I would tiptoe up to my old fifth floor, and I grew bold enough to climb the last creaking staircase to the peaked Garrett. There, in the narrow hall, outside the bolted door with the covered keyhole, I often heard sounds which filled me with an indefinable dread, the, the dread of vague wonder and brooding mystery. It was not that the sounds were hideous, for they were not, but they held weird vibrations suggesting nothing on this globe of Earth. And at certain intervals, they assumed a symphonic quality which I could not, which I could hardly conceive as produced by one player. Certainly, Eric Zan was a genius of wild power. As the weeks passed, the playing grew wilder, whilst the old musician acqu acquired an increasing haggardness and furtiveness, pitiful to behold. He now refused to admit me at any time, and shunned me whenever he met on the stairs. Then, one night as I listened at the door, I heard the shrieking viol swell into a chaotic babble of sound, a pandemonium which would have led me to doubt my own shaking sanity, had there not come from behind that barred portal a piteous proof that the horror was real. The awful, inarticulate cry which only a mute can utter, and which rises only in moments of the most terrible fear and anguish. I knocked repeatedly at the door, but received no response. Afterward, I waited in the black hallway, shivering with cold and fear, till I heard the pure, poor musician's feeble effort to rise from the floor by aid of a chair. Believing him just conscious after, fainting, after a fainting fit, I removed my wrapping, and at the same time, calling out my name reassuringly. I heard Zan stumble to the window and close, both shutter and stash, then stumble to the door, which he falteringly and fastened to admit me. This time his delight at having me present was real, for his distorted face gleamed with relief as he clutched at my coat and as a child clutches at its mother's skirts. Shaking pathetically, the old man forced me into a chair whilst he sank into another, beside his viol and bow lay carelessly on the floor. He sat for some time, inactive, nodding oddly, but having a paradoxical suggestion of intense and frightened listening. Subsequently, he seemed to be satisfied, and crossing to the chair by the table, he wrote a brief note, handed it to me, and returned it to the table, where he began to write rapidly and incessantly. The note implored me in the name of mercy, for the sake of my own curiosity, to wait where I was, while he prepared a full account in German of all the marvels and terrors which beset him. I waited, and the dumb man's pencil flew. It was perhaps an hour later, while I still waited and while the old man's feverishly written sheets still continued to pile up, that I saw Zan start from the hint of a horrible shock. Unmistakably, he was looking at the curtained window and listening shudderingly. Then I half fancied I, sound, I heard a sound myself. Though it wasn't a horrible sound, but rather an exquisitely low and infinitely distant musical note suggesting a player in one of the neighbouring houses, or in some abode abo above the lofty wall over which I had never been able to look. Upon Zan, the effect was terrible, for dropping his pencil he s when suddenly he rose, seized his viol, and commenced to rend the night with the wildest playing I had ever heard from his bow save from when I was listening at the barrel barred door. It would be useless to describe the playing of Eric Zan on, de on that dreadful night. It was more horrible than anything I had ever overheard, because I could now see the expression on his face and could realize that this time the motive was stark fear. He was trying to make a noise, to ward something off or drown something out. What? I could not imagine. Awesome, though I felt it must be. The playing crew frantic, delirious and hysterical, yet kept to the last qualities of supreme genius which I knew the strange, man strange old man possessed. I recognized the air, 
It was a wild Hungarian dance, popular in the theatres. And I reflected for a moment this was the first time I had ever play, heard Zan play the work of another composer. Louder and louder, wilder and wilder mounted the shrieking and whining of that desperate viol. The player was dripping with an uncanny perspiration that twisted like a monkey, always looking frantically at the curtained window. In his frenzied strains, I could almost see shadowy satyrs and bacchanals dancing and whirling incessantly through the seething abysses of cloud and smoke and lightning. And then I thought I heard a shriller, steadier note that was not from the viol. A calm, deliberate, purposeful, mocking note. Far away from the west. At this juncture, the shutter began to rattle in the howling night wind, which had sprung up outside as if answer to the mad playing within. Zan's screaming viol now did itself, emitting sounds I never thought a viol could emit. The shutter rattled more loudly, unfastened, and commenced slamming against the window. Then the glass broke, shiveringly under the persistent impacts, and the chill wind rushed in, making the candles sputter and the rustling sheets of paper on the table where Zan had begun to write out his horrible secret. I looked at Zan and saw that he was past conscious observation. His blue eyes were bulging glassy, sightless, and the frantic playing had become a blind, mechanical, unrecognizable orgy that no pen could even suggest. A sudden gust, stronger than others, caught up the manuscript and bore it toward the window. I followed the flying sheets in desperation, but they were gone before I reached the, before I reached the demolished panes. Then I remembered my old wish to gaze from this window. The only window in the Rudio Seal from which one might see the slope behind the wall. And the city had spread beneath. It was very dark. But the city's lights always burned, and I expected to see them there amidst the rain and wind. Yet, when I looked from that highest of all the gavel windows, looked while the colonel sputtered, and the insane viol howled at the night wind, I saw no city spread below. And no friendly lights gleamed from the remembered streets, but only the blackness of space illimitable. Unimagined space, alive with motion and music, and having no semblance of anything on earth. And as I stood there, looking in terror, the wind blew out both the candles in that ancient peaked garret, leaving me in strange, savage, and impenetrable darkness, with chaos and pandemonium before me, and the demon madness of that night-baying vial behind me. I staggered back in the dark without the means of striking a light, crashing against the table, overturning a chair, and finally groping my way to the place where the blackness screamed with the shocking music. To save myself and Eric Zan, I could at least try whatever the powers opposed to me. I once thought some chill thing brushed me, and I screamed. But my scream could not be heard over that hideous vial. Suddenly, out of the blackness, the madly sawing bow struck me, and I knew I was close to the player. I felt a head, touched the back of Zan's chair, and then found and shook his shoulder in an, el in an effort to bring him to his senses. He didn't respond. And still, the vial shrieked on without slackening. I moved my hand to his head, whose mechanical nodding I was able to stop, and shouted in his ear that we are, must both flee from the unknown things of the night, but neither he, he neither answered me nor abated the frenzy of his unutterable music. While all through the garret, strange currents of wind seemed to dance in the darkness and babble. When my hand touched his ear, I shuddered, though I knew not why, knew not why, till I felt of the still face, the ice-cold, stiffened, unbreathing face, whose glassy eyes bulged uselessly into the void. And then... By some miracle, finding the door and a large wooden bolt, I plunged wildly away. 
and that glassy-eyed thing in the dark. And from the ghoulish howling of that accursed vial whose fury increased, even as I plunged. Leaping, floating, flying down those endless stairs through the dark house, racing mindlessly out into the marrow and ancient streets, steps, and a rot- tottering houses, clattering down steps and over cobbles to the lower, street, lower streets of the putrid canyon walled river, panting across the great dark bridge to the broader, healthier streets and boulevards we know. All of these are terrible impressions that link with me. And I recall that there was no wind. And that the moon was out. And that all the lights of the city twinkled. Despite my most careful searches and investigations, I have never since been able to find the Rudy Seal. But I'm not wholly sorry. Either for this, or for the loss in undreamable abysses of the closely written sheets which alone could have explained the music of Eric Zan. Okay. Oh, that was a good one. I like that. Good boy, Lovecraft. That is what you do. That is how you write good... St- ooh, ooh, when he gets it right. God, does he get it right. Oh, that was pleasing. It leaves so many questions open. What could it have been? What were the freaking monsters, man? Ooh, that, that that feeling of I don't know, but I also want to know in the back of my mind. That is how, that is the good stuff, dude. That is, that is nice. It's beautiful. Oh, God. Mm. Take a sip of water because I am slowly dying. Excuse me, I have a bit of a cold. If you can, if you can, did you smell it? Can you hear that? I hope you can, because by God. Oh, cool. That was sick. All right. We certainly do have time for another one, but I'm going to have to find one pretty quickly. A good one as well, which is going to be uh, tricky considering, you know, it's, it's it's hard to find good stuff super quick. If I, if I can't find something in, like, I don't know, five minutes, then... Ooh, that was bad. I'm just going to find something that I've already... I already read, you know? Hmm. Is this one any good? Let me see. I'm looking at this one, but huh, I'm not I'm not I'm not sure. I'm not I'm not sure, man. I don't know, maybe it's not the good one. There is this one, which I've, uh... Which requires a lot of me being other characters, that's the thing. Hmm. I'm not sure if I can do it. I want to, because I, I, I've, this, I've, I've seen this story before, and I've heard, and I've heard very, very, very good things about it, but... You know what, I'm going to do it, because I feel fresh and funky, and you know what, there's nothing better than doing other characters' voices than with a cold. <laughs> yeah, it'll be fine, I'm sure. Let me just take a sip of water real quick. Ah, that's good water. It is extra good water. Really expensive water, because getting bottled water is a chore, and nobody likes to do it. But hey, what do I know? This is apparently a 25-minute story, so this should do us good. Unless, uh, actually, let's see how quick that that's, uh... Yeah, I can do that. I can do this. This is a big one. But, I think it'll be worth it in the end. So, without any further ado, this is a little story called Psychosis. I'm not entirely sure who's wrote it. It's, uh, it's not, there's no author attached. Depressingly, I wish there was. That'd be great. No, wait, yes, there is. Uh, credited to Matt Dimersky. Dimersky. There you go. Got it in the end. Got got that good name. Got that name down. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, let's get down to business. This is psychosis. (laughs) 
Sunday. I'm not sure why I'm writing this down on paper and not on my computer. I guess I've just noticed some odd things. It's not that I don't trust the computer, I just need to organize my thoughts. I need to get all down the details somewhere, objective, somewhere I know what I, that what I write can't be deleted or changed. No, no, not that, that, that that's happened, it's just that everything blurs together here. And the fog of memory leads, lends a strange cast to things. I'm starting to feel cramped in this small apartment. Maybe that's the problem. I just had to go and choose the cheapest apartment, the only one in the basement. Uh, the lack of windows down here makes night, day, and night and day seem to slip by seamlessly. And I haven't been out in a few days because I've been working on this programming project so intensely. I suppose I just wanted to get this done. Hours of sitting and staring in a monitor can make anyone feel strange. I know, but I don't think that's it. I'm not sure when I started to feel like something was odd. I can't even define what it is. Maybe I just haven't talked to anybody in a while. Well, that's the first thing that actually crept up to me. Everyone I normally talk to online while I program has been idle, or they've simply not logged on at all. My instant messages go unanswered. The last email I got from anybody was a friend saying he talked to me when he got back from the store, and that was yesterday. I call with my cell phone, but reception's terrible down here. Yeah, uh, that's it. I, I just need to call someone. I'm gonna go outside. Oh, that didn't work out so well. <sighs> the tingle of fear fades. I'm feeling a little ridiculous for being scared at all. I looked in the mirror before I went out, but I didn't shave the two-day stubble I've grown. I, I figured I was just going out for a quick cell phone call. I did just changed my shirt, though, because it was lunchtime, and I, I guessed that I'd run into at least one person I knew. Uh, that, that didn't end up happening. I wish it did. When I went out, I opened the door to my small apartment s slowly. A small feeling of apprehension had somehow already lodged itself within me, uh, for some undefinable reason. I chalked it up to having not spoken to anyone but myself for a day or two. I peered down the dingy, grey hallway, and made dingier by the fact that it was a basement hallway. On one end, a large metal door led to the building's furnace room. It was locked, of course. Two dreary soda machines stood by it. Uh, I bought a soda from it for the first day I've moved in, but it had this two-year-old expiration date. I'm fairly certain nobody knows these machines are even down here, or my cheap landlady just doesn't care to get them restocked. I closed my door softly and walked the other direction. Taking care to not make a sound. I have no idea why, why I chose to do that, but it was it was fun. Giving in to the strange impulse to not break the droning hum of the soda machines, at least for a moment. I got to the stairwell and took the stairs up to the building's front door. I looked through the heavy door's small square window and received quite the shock. It definitely wasn't lunchtime. The city gloom hung over the dark street outside, and the traffic lights at the intersection in the distance blinked yellow. Dim clouds, purple and black from the glow of the city, hung overhead. Nothing moved, save the few sidewalk trees that shifted in the wind. I remember shivering, but I wasn't cold. Maybe it was the wind outside. I could vaguely hear it through the heavy metal door, and I knew it was a unique kind of late night wind. The kind that was that was constant, cold, and quiet. Save for the rhythmic music it made as it passed through countless unsee tree, unseen tree leaves. I decided not to go outside. Instead, I lifted my cell phone to the door's little window and checked the signal meter. The bars filled up the meter, and I smiled. Time to hear somebody else's voice. I remember thinking, relieved. It was such a strange thing to be afraid of nothing. I shook my head, laughing at myself silently. I had speed dial from my best friend, and Amy's number, and held the phone up to my ear. It rang once, then it stopped. 
Nothing happened. I listened to the silence for a good 20 seconds, then hung up. I frowned and looked at the signal meter again, still, still full. I went to dial her number again, and then my phone rang in my hand, startling me. I put it up to my ear. Hello? I asked, immediately fighting down a small shock at hearing the first spoken voice in days, even if it was my own. I had gotten used to the droning hum of the buildings and inner workings, my, my computer and the soda machines in the hallway. There was no response to my greeting at first, but then a voice finally came. Hey, said a clear male voice, obviously of college age like me. Who's this? Uh, John, I replied, confused. Oh, sorry, wrong number, he replied, and then hung up. I lowered my phone slowly and leaned against the thick brick wall of the stairwell. That was strange. I looked at my received calls list, but the number was unfamiliar. Before I could think on it further, the phone rang loudly, shocking me again. This time, I looked at the caller before I answered. It was another unfamiliar number. This time, I held my phone to my ear, but said nothing. I heard nothing but the general background noise of a phone. Then, a familiar voice broke my attention. John was the single word, in Amy's voice. I breathed a sigh of relief. Hey, it's you, I replied. Who else would it be? She responded. Oh, the number. I'm at a party at 7th Street and my phone died just as you called me. This is someone else's phone, obviously. Oh, okay, I said. Where are you? She asked. My eyes glanced over the drab, whitewashed cylinder block walls and the heavy metal door with its small built window. At my building, I sighed. Just feeling coked up. I didn't realize it was so late. You should come here, she said, laughing. Nah, I don't like looking for some strange place by myself in the middle of the night, I said, looking out the window at the silent, windy street that secretly scared me just a tiny bit. I think I'm just going to keep working on go to bed. Nonsense, he replied. I can come and get you. Your building's close to 7th Street, right? How drunk are you? I asked lightheartedly. You know where I live. Oh, of course, she said abruptly. I, I guess I can't get there by walking, huh? You could if you wanted to waste half an hour. I told her. Right, she said. Okay, I have to go. Good luck with your work. I lowered the phone once more, looking at the numbers flash as the call ended. Then the droning silence suddenly reasserted itself in my ears. The two strange calls in the eerie street outside just drove home my aloneness in this empty stairwell. Perhaps from having seen too many scary movies, I had the sudden inexplicable idea that something could look in the door's window and see me, some sort of horrible entity that hovered at the edge of aloneness, just waiting to creep on it up on unsuspecting people that strayed too far from human beings. I knew this fear was irrational, but nobody else was around, so I jumped on the stairs, ran down the hallway to my room, and closed the door as swiftly as I could while staying silent. Like I said, I felt a little ridiculous for being scared of nothing, and that fear has already faded. Writing this down helps a lot. It makes me realize that nothing's wrong. It filters out any half-formed thoughts and fears that leaves only cold, hard facts. <sighs> it's late. I got a call from a wrong number. Amy's phone died, so she called me back from another number. Nothing strange is happening. Still, there was something off a little bit off about that conversation. I knew it could have just been the alcohol she'd had, or was it even that she seemed off to me? Or was it? Yes, that that was it. I didn't even realize to this moment, writing these down, I knew writing these things down would help. She said she was at a party, but I only heard silence in the background. 
Of course, that doesn't mean anything in particular. She could have just gone outside to make the call. No, I, that, that couldn't be it either. I didn't even hear the wind. I need to see the wind still blowing. Monday. I forgot to finish writing last night. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what I expected to see when I ran up the stairwell and looked out the heavy metal door's window. I am feeling ridiculous. Last night's fear seems a hazy and reasonable and unreasonable to me now. <sighs> I can't wait to go out into the sunlight. I'm going to check my email, shave, shower, and finally get out of here. Wait. I think I heard something. It was thunder. That that whole sunlight and fresh air thing didn't happen. I went down to the stairwell and up the stairs only to find disappointment. The heavy metal's door heavy metal door's little window showed only flowing water as torrential rain slammed against it. Only a very dim, gloomy light fil filtered in throughout the rain. But I at least knew it was daytime, even if it was a grey, sickly wet day. I tried looking out the window and waiting for the lightning to illuminate the gloom, but the rain was too heavy and I couldn't make anything out. And more weight and more vague, weird shapes moving at all angles and the waves washing down the window. <laughs> Disappointed, I turned around, but I... I didn't go back into my room. Instead, I wandered further up the stairs, past the first floor and then the second. The stairs ended at the first third floor, the highest floor in the building. I looked through the glass that ran up the outer wall of the stairwell, but it was that warped, thick kind that scattered the light. Uh, not that there was anything much to see throughout the rain to begin with. I opened the stairwell door and wandered down the hallway. The ten or so thick wooden doors, painted, painted blue a long time ago, were all closed. I listened as I walked, but it was the middle of the day, so I, I wasn't surprised that I heard nothing but the rain outside. As I stood there in the dim hallway listening to the rain, I had the strange, fleeting impression that the doors were standing like silent granite monoliths erected by some ancient, forget forgotten civilization for some unfathomable god named purpose. Lightning flashed, and, and, and I could have sworn for just a moment the old grainy blue wood looked like rough stone. I laughed at myself for letting the imagination get to me, but then it occurred to me that the dim gloom and lightning must mean that there was a window somewhere in the hallway. A vague memory surfaced, and I suddenly recalled that the third floor had an alcove and an inset window halfway down the floor's hallway. Excited to look at the rain and possibly see another human being, I quickly walked over to, to the alcove, finding the large, thin glass window. Rain washed down it as with the front door's window, but I could only, I could open this one. I reached a hand out to slide it open, but hesitated. I had the strangest feeling that if I opened that window, I would see something absolutely horrifying on the other side. Everything's been so odd lately. So I came up with a plan, and I came back here to get what I needed. I, I, I didn't seriously think anything will come of it, but I'm, I'm bored, it's raining, and I'm going stir-crazy. I came back to get my webcam. Cord isn't long enough to reach the third floor by any means, so instead I'm going to hide it between the two soda machines on the dark end of the basement hallway, run the wire along the wall and under my door, and put black duct tape over the wire to blend it in with the plastic strip that longs along the base of the hallway's whole walls. I, I know this is silly, but I, I don't have anything better to do. Well, nothing's happened. I propped up in the hallway to stairwell door, steeled myself, then flung the heavy front door wide open and ran like hell down the stairs to my room and slammed the door. I'm watching the webcam on my computer intently, seeing the hallway outside my door and most of the stairwell. I I'm watching it right now, and, and, and I don't see anything interesting. I just wish that the camera's position was different so that they could see out the front door. Hey, something's online!
I got an older, less functional webcam that I had in my closet to video the chat with my friend online. I really couldn't explain to him why I wanted a video chat, but it, it felt good to see another person's face. He couldn't talk very long, we didn't talk about anything meaningful, but I feel much better. My strange fear has almost passed. I, I would feel completely better, but there was something odd about our conversation. I know that I've said that everything seemed odd, but still, he was very vague in his responses. I can't recall one specific thing he said. No particular name, no place, no event, but... He did ask for my email address to keep in touch. Oh, wait. Just got an email. I'm about to go out. Just got an email from Amy that asked me to meet her for dinner at the place we usually go to. I really do love pizza. And I've been eating random food from my poorly stocked fridge for days, so I can't wait. Again, I feel ridiculous about the odd couple of days I've been having. Uh, I should destroy this journal when I get back. Oh! Another email. Uh, oh my god. Oh. oh my god. I almost left the email and opened the door. I almost opened the door. I almost opened the door, but I, I read the email first. It was a friend I, from I hadn't seen in a long time, and it was sent to a huge number of emails that must have been every person he'd saved in his address list. It had no subject. It said simply, Seen with your own eyes. Don't trust them. They. What the hell does that mean? What the hell is that supposed to mean? The word sh shocked me and I keep going over them. It's a desperate email. Just, just something happened. The words are obviously cut off without finishing. And, and the other day I would have dismissed this as spam or, or from a computer virus or something. But the words seen with your own eyes? I can't help but read this journal and think back to the first few days and realize that I have not seen another person with my own eyes or talked to another person face to face. The webcam conversation with my friend feels so strange, so vague, so eerie, but now that I think about it, was it? Or is fear clouding my memory? My, my mind toys with the progression of events I've written here, pointing out that I've not been presented with one single fact that I did not specifically give out unsuspectingly. The random wrong number that I got that got my name and subsequent strange retalk, return call from Amy, the friend that asked for my email address. I met at them first when I saw him online. And then I got my first email a few minutes ago and after that conversation, oh my, oh my god, that phone call with Amy, I said, I said over the phone, I said I was within a half hour's walk of 7th Street. They, they know I'm near here. What, what are they trying to find me? Where is everyone else? I have- why haven't I seen or heard anyone else in days? No, 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 this is- this is absolutely crazy. I need to calm down. This- this madness has to end. I don't know what to think. I ran out of my apartment furiously, holding my cell phone up to every corner to see it. If I got a signal through the heavy walls. Finally, in the tiny bathroom near one ceiling corner, I got a single bar. Holding my phone there, I sent a text message to every number on my list. Uh, not wanting to betray anything about my unfounded fears, I simply say, sent. You seen anyone face to face recently? I, I, at, that, at that point, I just wanted to reply back. I didn't care what the reply was or if I embarrassed myself. I tried to call someone a few times, but I couldn't just get my head high enough. And if I brought myself down, my cell phone down even an inch, it lost its signal. Then I remembered my computer and rushed over it. I instantly messaging everybody online. Most were idle away from their computer. Nobody responded. My messages grew even more frantic, and I started telling people where I was just to stop by in person for a host of barely passable reasons. I didn't care about anything by that point. I just needed to see another person. I, I also tore apart my apartment for something I might have missed, some way to contact another human being without opening the door. I, I, I know it's crazy. I know it's unfounded, but what if? What if? I needed to be sure. I just needed to be sure. 
I take the phone to the ceiling, just in case. Tuesday. The phone rang! Exhausted from last night's rampage, I must have fallen asleep. I woke to the phone ringing and ran to the bathroom, stood on the toilet, flipped open the phone, taped to the ceiling. It was Amy, and I feel so much better. She was really worried about me, and apparently had been con trying to contact me since the last time I talked to you. Her. She's coming over now, and yes, she knows where I am without telling her. I, f I feel so embarrassed. I am definitely throwing this journal away before anybody sees it. I don't even know why I'm writing this now. Maybe it's just it's the only communication I've had since God knows when. Oh, I look like hell too. I, I looked in the mirror before I came back here. My, my eyes are sunken. My stubble is, is thicker. My apartment is trashed. But, 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 but I'm, I'm not going to clean it up. I think I need someone else to see what I've been through. These past few days have not been normal. I am not one to imagine things, and I know I've been the victim, the victim of extreme probability. I, I probably missed seeing another person a dozen times. I, I just happened to go out when it was late at night or in the middle of the day when everyone was gone. Everything perfect, everything is perfectly fine. I know this now. Plus, I found something in the closet last night that helped me, helped me tremendously. A television. I set it up just before I wrote this, and it's on in the background. <sighs> Television's always been an escape for me, and it reminds me that there's a world beyond these dingy brick walls. I'm glad Amy's the only one who responded to me after that last night's frantic pestering of everybody I could contact. She's been my best friend for years. She doesn't know it, but I count the day that I met her among one of the few moments of true happiness in my life. I remember that warm summer day fondly. It seems too different reality from this dark, rainy, hopeless, lonely place. I, I felt like I spent days sitting in that playground, much too old to play. Just talking with her and hanging out and doing nothing at all. I still feel like I can go back to that moment sometimes, and it reminds me that this damn place is not all there is. <gasps> Finally, knock on the door. I thought it was odd. I couldn't see her through the camera. I hid between the two soda machines. I I thought I figured it would be bad positioning, like when I couldn't see her at the front door. I should have known. I should have known. After the knock, I yelled through the door jokingly that I had a camera between the two soda machines because I was embarrassed that if I t that I'd taken paranoia this far. After I did that, I saw her image walk over to the camera and look down at it. She smiled and waved. Hey! She said to the camera brightly, giving a wry look. It's it's weird. I know. I said to the mic attached to my computer. I've had a weird few days. Must have, she replied. Open the door, John. I hesitated. How can I be sure? <laughs> Hey, humor me for a second here, I told her through the mic. Uh, tell me one thing about us, just prove to me you're you. She gave the camera a weird look. Um, alright, she said, slowly, thinking. We met randomly at a playground when we were both way too old to be there. I sighed deeply as reality returned and fear fainted. God, I've been so ridiculous. Of course it was Amy. That day wasn't anywhere in the world except my memory. I'd never mentioned it to anyone, not out of embarrassment, but of a strange, secret nostalgia and longing for those days to return. If there was some unknown force at work trying to trick me as I feared, there was no way they could know about that day. <sighs> all right, all right. I'll explain everything, I told her. Be right there. I ran to my small bathroom and fixed my hair as best as I could. I looked like hell, but she would understand. Snickering at my own unbelievable behavior and the mess I'd made of this place, I walked to the door, I put my hand on the doorknob and gave the mess one last look. 
So ridiculous, I thought. My eyes traced over the half-eaten food lying on the ground, the overflowing trash bin, and the bed I'd tipped to the one side looking for. God knows what. I almost turned to the door and opened it, but my eyes fell on one last thing. The old webcam I'd used to chat with my friend earlier yesterday. Its silent black sphere lay haphazardly tossed to the side. Its lens pointed to the table where the journal lay. An overwhelming terror took me as I realized that if something could see through that camera, it would have just been what I wrote about that day. I asked her for anything, one thing about us, and she chose the only thing in the world that I thought or they did not know. But it, it, it did! I wrote it down, and it, it did know. It could have been watching me the whole time. I didn't open the door. I screamed. I screamed in uncontrollable terror. I stomped on the old webcam on the floor. The door sh shook, and the doorknob tried to turn, but I didn't hear Amy's voice through the door. Was the basement door made to keep out drafts too thick, or was it not Amy outside? What could have been trying to get in if not her? What the hell is out there? I saw her on my computer through the camera outside. I heard her on the speakers through the camera outside. But was it real? How can I know? She's gone now. I screamed and shouted for help. I piled anything in my apartment against the front door. Friday. At least I think it's Friday. I broke everything in electronics, smashed my computer to pieces, every single thing that could have been asked by an access by network, or worse, altered. I'm a programmer, I know. Every little piece of information I gave out since the start, my name, my email, my location, none of it came back from outside until I gave out. I've been going over and over what I wrote, I've been pacing back and forth, alternating between stark terror and overpowering disbelief. Sometimes I'm absolutely certain that some phantom entity is dead set in the simple goal of getting me to go outside. Back to the beginning with the phone call from Amy, she was effectively asking me the door, to open the door and go outside. I keep running this through my head. One point of view says I've acted like a madman, and all of this is the extreme convergence of probability. Never going outside at the right hands by times by pure luck. Never seeking another person by pure chance. Getting a random nonsense email from some computer virus at just the right time. The other view says that extreme convergence of possibility is the reason that whatever's out there hasn't got me already. I keep thinking. I never opened the window on the third floor. I never opened the front door until that incredibly stupid stunt with a hidden camera after which I had straight, ran straight into my room and slammed the door. I haven't opened my own door since I flung out the front door of the building. Whatever's out there, if anything's out there, never made an appearance in this building before I opened that front door. Maybe the reason it wasn't in the building was already was that it was elsewhere, catching everybody else. And then it waited until I... Betrayed my existence but trying to call Amy, a call which didn't work. Until it called me and asked my name. Terror literally overwhelms me every time I try and fit the pieces of this nightmare together. That email, short, cut off, was it from someone trying to get the word out? Some, some friendly voice trying to warn me before it came? Seen with my own eyes, don't trust them. Exactly what I've been so suspicious of. It, it could have masterful control of all things electronic, practicing its insidious deception to trick me into coming outside. Why can't it get in? It knocked on the door. It must have some solid presence. The door, the, the image of these doors in the upper hallway as guardian marvelous flashes in my mind every time I trace back to this place, a path of thoughts. Is there some phantom entity trying to get me outside? Maybe it can't go through doors. I, I, I keep thinking over all the books I've read and all the movies I've seen, trying to generate some explanation for this. Doors have always been such an intense foci of human imagination, always seen as wards or portals of special importance, so perhaps the door's just too thick. I know I couldn't bash through any of the doors in this building, let alone the heavy basement ones, but, but aside from that, the real question is, why does it want me? If it wanted to kill me, it could do it in many ways, including just waiting till I starve to death. 
But what if it doesn't want to kill me? What if it has some more horrific fate in store for me? God. God, what can I do to escape this nightmare? A knock on the door. I told the people on the other side of the door, I need a minute to think and I'll come out. I'm really writing this down just so I can figure out what to do. At least this time I heard those voices. My paranoia and... Yes. I recognize I'm being paranoid. As me thinking of all sorts of ways their voices could be faked electronically. There could be nothing but speakers outside, simulating unique voices. Did it really take them three days to come to talk to me? Amy Simodelisty out there, along with two policemen and a psychiatrist. Maybe it took them three days to think of what to say to me. The psychiatrist came, could be pretty convincing, if I decided to think this would all been a crazy misunderstanding and not some enemy trying to trick me into opening the door. Psychiatrist had an older voice. <laughs> Oh, they're terrible and still caring. I, I liked it. Oh, I'm just desperate just to see someone in my own eyes. He said I had something called cyberpsychosis, and I'm just one of a nationwide epidemic of thousands of people having breakdowns triggered by a suggestive email that got through somehow. I swear, he said, got through somehow. I think he means spread through the country inexplicably, but I'm incredibly suspicious that the entity slipped up and revealed something. He said I'm part of a wave of emergent behavior, that a lot of other people are having the same problem, the same fears, even though we've never communicated. Then that neatly explains the strange email about the eyes that I got. I didn't get the original triggering email, I got a descendant of it. My friend could have broken down too and tried to warn everything that he knew about his paranoid fears. That's how the problem spreads, the psychiatrist claims. I could have spread it too with my texts and instant messages online to everybody I know. One of those people might be melting down right now after being triggered by something I sent them, something they might interpret any way they want, something like a text saying, Anyone seen face to face lately? The psychiatrist told me that he didn't want to lose another one, that people like me are intelligent and that's our downfall. We, try, we draw connections so well and then we draw them even when they shouldn't be there. He said it's easy to get caught up in paranoia in a first fast-paced world, it's a constantly changing place where more and more of our interaction is stimulated. I have to give him one thing, it's a great explanation. It neatly explains everything, it perfectly explains everything. In fact, I have every reason to shake off this nightmarish fear that something or consciousness or being out there wants me to open the door so it can capture me for some horrible fate worse than death. It would be foolish, after hearing that explanation, to stay in here until I starve to death just to spite the enemy that might have knocked everybody else. It would be foolish to think that after hearing that explanation, I might be one of the last people left alive in an empty world, hiding in a secure basement room, spitting some unthinkable deceptive enemy just by refusing to be captured. It's a perfect explanation for every single strange thing I've ever seen or heard, and I have every reason in the world to let go of my fears and open that door. Exactly why I'm not going to. How can I be sure? How can I know what's real and what's deception? All of these damn things with the wires and signals that originate from some unseen origin, they're not real. I can't be sure. Signals through a camera, fake video, deceptive phone calls, emails, even the television, lying broken on the floor. How can I possibly know it's real? It's all just signals, waves, light. Door. It's bashing on the door. It's trying to get in. What the, what insane mechanical contrivance would it be using to simulate the sound of men attacking the heavy wood so well? Oh god, at least I'll finally see it with my own eyes. There's, there's nothing left in here to deceive me with. I've ripped apart everything else. I can't deceive my eyes, can I? See it with your own eyes. Don't trust them. They... Wait, what, was that just a separate message trying to... to trust my eyes or warning me about my eyes too? Oh my god, what's the difference between the camera and my eyes? Light into electrical. They, they both turn light into electrical signals. They, they're the same. I can't be deceived. I have to be sure. I have to be sure.
Date unknown. I calmly asked for a paper and pen, day in, day out, until they finally gave them to me. Not that it matters. What am I gonna do? Poke my eyes out? I just feel like part of me now. Pain is gone. I figure this will be one of my last chances to write legibly, as without having sight to correct mistakes, my hands are gonna slowly forget the motions involved. This is a sort of self-indulgence, this, this writing. It's a relic of another time. Because I'm certain everyone left in the world is dead or something worse. I sit in a padded wall, day in, day out. The enemy brings me food and water and masks itself as this kind of nurse and an unsympathetic doctor. I think it knows that my hearing is sharpened considerably now that I live in darkness. It fakes conversations in the hallways on the off chance that I might overhear. One of the nurses talks about having a baby soon. One of the doctors lost his wife in a car accident. None of it matters. None of it real. None of it gets me. Not like she does. That's the worst part. The part I almost can't handle. The thing comes to me masquerading as Amy. Its recreation is perfect. It sounds exactly like her. It feels exactly like her. It produces a reasonable facsimile of tears that makes me feel when its lifelike Jake cheeks. When they first dragged me here, it told me that all the things I wanted to hear. It told me that she loved me, that she'd always loved me, that it didn't understand why I did this, that we could still have a life together. <laughs> if only I would stop insisting I was being deceived. No. It needed me to believe that she was real. I almost fell for it. I really did. I doubted myself for the longest time in the end. Though it was all too perfect, too flawless, too real. The force Amy used to come every day, then every week, and then finally stopped coming altogether. But I don't think the entity will give up. I think the waiting game is just another one of its gambits. I'll resist the entirety of my life if I have to. I don't know what happened to the rest of the world, but I do know that this thing needs me to fall for its deceptions. If it needs that, then maybe, just maybe, I'm a thorn in its agenda. Maybe Amy's alive there somewhere, still, kept only by my will to resist the deceiver. I hold on to that hope, rocking back and forth in my, fel my cell just to pass the time. I'll never give in. I'll never break. I'm a hero. The doctor read the paper the patient had scribbled on. It was barely readable, written in a shaky script of one who could not see. He wanted to smile at the man's steadfast resolve, a reminder of the human will to survive. But he knew the patient was completely delusional. After all, the same man would have fallen for this deception long ago. The doctor wanted to smile. He wanted to whisper words of encouragement to the delusional man. He wanted to to scream. But the nerve filaments wrapped around his head and into the eyes made him do otherwise. His body walked into the cell like a puppet and told the patient once more that he was wrong. And then there was nobody trying to deceive him. What a twist! Oh! Ooh! You're all controlled by the government. You just don't know it. Or you do know it. Um, you might know it. And, and if you do know, then you should be scared. And, and, and clearly people are. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. That's a story about somebody getting paranoid. For, for reasons. Whether or not, whether or not that last bit's just being made up in that guy's head is, is up for, is up for the, is up for the, the world to debate. Either way, that was a pretty nice story, well written, and allowed me to emote a lot, so that was fun. But it went 15 minutes overboard, uh, the usual hour. So, you know, you get a big session today. That's great. Big old reading from me, your host, Mr. 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 Voice. And, 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 and abrupt horror and not being good at words sometimes. Anyway, that was the Spook Zone. That was a very fun session. I enjoyed myself immensely. Hopefully anybody who was listening did so too. Um, I am your humble host. Uh, next week I'll be back again. 
presumably reading some more Lovecraft and another little story. But until that day, uh, stay cool, everyone. Uh, stay fresh, stay, stay funky, but above all, stay spooked.